everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, it's my second visit in Bangalore. Uh, in 2011, I was here for a family wedding. So it's nice to be back in the city. Um, I want to uh, just introduce my two sisters. This is a picture of me from about 30 years ago. <laughs> you might be able to see a slight change. Um, uh, my sister Susie is the one in the wheelchair, and she was born with uh, disabilities, sadly passed away last year, but had a very fulfilling life. Um, I want to start my presentation by paying special tribute to Feroz, who has organized this event. <laughs> So I, I met Feroz, and uh, he said, you must come to Bangalore, you must see what we're doing. And he tried to explain to me about India Inclusion Summit. And the word inclusion, I felt, was very, very, very important. But he said, you've no idea what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach the whole world to, to explain the importance of inclusion for people with disabilities. So here I am. I'm thanking very much for the invitation. I think that what Feroz and his team have created is unique internationally. I go to many countries to look at the work of what's going on in my field, which is autism, but in related disabilities. And here in India, I think you are leading the way uh, with this summit. <clears throat> so um, Feroz asked me to talk about the concept of neurodiversity in the context of inclusion. And neurodiversity, I think, is a really fantastic, relatively new idea. It's the idea that uh, different minds and different brains are wired differently, and that there's no single way to be normal, in quotes. There are many different ways to be normal. Uh, some people have uh, strengths in language or in social skills, but other people have strengths in other ways, in music, uh, or in uh, attention to detail, uh, or in technology, many different ways to use your mind and to think differently. And neurodiversity celebrates that diversity. And of course, it comes from the older concept of biodiversity. We now recognize how important, important it is to celebrate the range of life forms on the planet, not just plants, but also animals. And you can see on the front cover of this new book, Neurotribes, which is a recent publication about autism, the author, Steve Silberman, has an image about biodiversity, but he's talking about the importance of recognizing people who think differently. So in my country, in the UK, uh, in 2005, the government passed a new piece of legislation called the Disability Discrimination Act. And you might wonder, why did the government need a piece of legislation to protect people with disabilities from discrimination? After all, isn't it the case that everybody recognizes people with disabilities should be included? should not be discriminated against. Well, part of the first part of my presentation is to remind you that life was not always very positive for people with disabilities, and that the importance of the event today is a whole change in how we're thinking and a way of moving away from the past. This is a very beautiful place where in my country, in England, people with disabilities are living, very tranquil environment. It's called Winterbourne View. And undercover journalists went in to see how people with disabilities were being cared for and took these undercover photographs or films which revealed that the staff in the care home were showing the opposite of care. They were showing cruelty to people with disabilities. Now, the history of how we treat people with disabilities has a very painful story. This is a poster from the 1930s in Germany 
a propaganda poster where the government was trying to convince the people that the cost of maintaining or supporting a person with disabilities during their lifetime was 60,000 Reichmarks. They were using an economic argument to argue that we should, the government should sterilize people with disabilities so that they don't pass on their genes. This was the concept of eugenics. And when Hitler came to power in 1933, the first law that he passed was the Sterilization Act, requiring doctors to send their patients with disabilities to be compulsorily sterilized. And under the Nazi regime, 400,000 people with disabilities went through compulsory sterilization. It wasn't just happening in Nazi Germany. It was happening in the United States, the so-called land of the free. You can see this map, which shows that 33 different states in America also passed legislation requiring compulsory sterilization of people with disabilities. This is Alexander Bell. Many of you recognize him as the inventor of the telephone. That was something good. But he was also president of the International Society for Eugenics, where he was a strong advocate for compulsory sterilization of people with disabilities. This place looks very beautiful. It's the Hartheim Center, part of the, uh, in the, the estate of the Hartheim Castle in Austria. And in 1939, Hitler passed a second piece of legislation uh, which was requiring that doctors should send patients with disabilities to this center for compulsory treatment. In fact, the treatment was euthanasia, and during the period of the Nazi regime, some 30,000 people with disabilities were killed in this center. So a long, painful history of exclusion, discrimination, abuse towards people with disabilities, and how far we've come today to recognize the opposite extreme of inclusion. So now I want to switch. Apologies for the very um, uh, negative start to this talk, but we have to remember the history so we don't repeat the mistakes. I want to now talk about autism. Autism, many of you know, is a disability, but I would say it involves difference, part of neurodiversity, and sometimes even involves talent. And we should be celebrating all disabilities, including people with autism. Let me tell you what I've learned about autism through meeting people and studying people with autism. This is an image of, I think, um, uh, someone with autism, but it says a lot in one picture. We have a child who is playing alone, and we know that autism makes it difficult to socialize and to communicate. But this child is also doing something different. He is fascinated by patterns, and he's lining up his toys, his little cars, in very specific patterns. People with autism think differently. This is part of the neurodiversity. They may not find it easy to socialize, but they love creating patterns. This is a study that came from California, the University of California in San Diego, where they took children who were coming into the clinic at the youngest age you can diagnose autism, which is around 18 months to two years old, and they presented two different kinds of things to look at, a human face or a geometric design. And they filmed the children to see how long they look at the face or the object. A typical child naturally looks at the face. They're wired to look at the social world. Children with autism, they found, prefer to look at the object, not at the face. They find geometric patterns more interesting. In fact, this study found that if a child looks for more than 70% of the time at the object, not at the face, the probability that that child has autism is 100%. 
So this is suggesting from the earliest age you can recognize autism, these children are looking at the world in a different way. It's not a sign of disorder. It's not a sign that something is broken or a defect or an impairment. It's simply that they're interested by different aspects of the world. We've done some research where we show images like this to people with autism, and we ask them to see if you can find the cube hidden in the large picture. Typical people get distracted by the big picture, and so they miss the detail, but people with autism are super quick and super accurate at finding the cube within the whole. So actually, although they have a disability when it comes to socializing and communication, on measures like this, tasks like this, they show the opposite of disability, they show talent. And actually that talent is often manifested in fantastic art. This is a picture by a man with autism called Peter Myers, where you can see all of the tiny details, like the pixels in his work, because he loves to make patterns. Attention to detail is a characteristic of autism. They spot things that other people might miss, and it can be expressed as talent. This is a man called Derek Paravicini, living in London. He has been blind from birth, but he also has autism, and he loves music. His interest in patterns and in detail comes out in his love of music. And in fact, he plays jazz, jazz keyboards, and he goes around the world performing because whenever he hears one jazz song, just once, he can reproduce it perfectly. And uh, <laughs> so we can either focus on the things he finds difficult, like vision or socializing, or we could focus on the things that he enjoys and the things that he's good at. In fact, remarkably, if you play a chord on the piano with 10 notes, any chord, after just hearing it once, he can name every note in the chord. So his attention to detail is remarkable. We found that people with autism love systems. Systems like mechanical systems or systems that follow rules and that are predictable. And whilst people with autism may struggle with socializing, if you present them with a system which is predictable, they become more interested than others and they could even excel in understanding and using that system. So this leads me to an interesting new way to think about autism, because people with autism love patterns and love systems. In fact, there's another group in our society who loves patterns and systems, and that is scientists. But maybe there's a connection between people with autism and scientists in their love of patterns and systems. Here's the pediatrician Hans Asperger. Many of you know his name because it's given to one of the subgroups of people on the autism spectrum. He was writing in the 1940s in Vienna, uh, and he said, for success in science, a dash of autism is essential. His idea was that maybe to excel in focusing on small details to really understand a system, it helps not to be distracted by the social world, but to really focus on the world of objects, the world of things. Just to advance the slide. So we've been looking, uh, sorry, let me go back. You recognize these two scientists, two physicists, Albert Einstein and Isaac Newton. Some biographers have suggested they had autism. They obviously excelled in their field of physics. Uh, Albert Einstein um, discovering the concept of relativity, Isaac Newton discovering the concept of gravity. But both of them, if you read about their lives, struggled to socialize, uh, struggled with communication. Einstein didn't speak until he was five years old, and yet made fantastic contributions in understanding the world of objects. Einstein famously said, I do not socialize, 
because it would distract me from my work. So he was more focused on the world of objects than the world of people. Well, making a diagnosis of people who are no longer living is problematic, especially based on, on biography. We've been looking at living scientists and found that if you give them a measure of autistic traits, in fact, scientists score higher than people in the general population in terms of number of autistic traits. So there is a connection between being a good scientist and having some traits uh, of autism. In my university in Cambridge, we did a study looking at students who study mathematics and asked them, do you have a diagnosis of autism? Surprisingly, we found a higher number of the mathematicians with a diagnosis of autism compared to students in the humanities. So there is a connection between autism, mathematical talent, scientific talent. We then looked at the fathers and grandfathers of children with autism, let me go back, to see what, what are these fathers and grandfathers doing in their work. If there's a genetic contribution to autism, maybe we see something special in these families. And we found that a disproportionate number of fathers of children with autism work in the field of engineering. <clears throat> so they have talent at science, at understanding systems, genetically linked to having a child with autism. So this led, and I'm going to finish in a minute, to this question, might autism be more common in places like Silicon Valley, or maybe here in Bangalore, <coughs> where there are many people with talent at understanding information technology and science. We did a study in the Netherlands um, comparing the rate of autism in the city of Eindhoven, which is the Silicon Valley of the Netherlands because they had the Philips factory there for 100 years, attracting people in electronics, computer science, IT, to move to that city. And we compared autism in Eindhoven to two other cities in the Netherlands, found it was more than twice as common in that city compared to the other two Dutch cities. So this is suggesting Autism is actually genetically potentially linked to talent in understanding the physical world, understanding systems, understanding detail in how the world works. I'm going to finish with this uh, image of 10-year-old Max Park in California. He has a fascination with the Rubik Cube, and he is listed in the top 100 players of the Rubik Cube internationally. Max has autism, and Max's fascination with the cube leads him not only to perform the, cube, the Rubik Cube, the three by three, but also the four by four, the five by five, increasing complexity. Despite his disability, he's showing what he's good at. Thank you very much.